Thank you, Chuck, and greetings to everyone. My wife and I are just on our way back from Florida from a nice vacation that we had. It was really enjoyable. And want to say hi to everyone from the Arzadon family in New Orleans, or excuse me, New, North Carolina. We were in North Carolina a couple of days with them, and they miss everybody back here in Michigan. Wanted to be sure they said hi to all of you and Dave and Kathy and the rest of the group. But uh, the weather was kind of nasty this morning, as Chuck has mentioned, kind of icy out here in a little bit, and I hope it's not too bad going toward western Michigan as we leave here to go that way. Really appreciated Chuck's update on what went on in the weekend down there in Lexington. It was very uh, exciting, it excited me with the fact that uh, hopefully in another year that I can be able to go down there too. And uh, also the good news about uh, the conference, which I knew was coming up in June for uh, in New Orleans, and I hope a lot of people will be able to start planning for that and maybe attend for that also. But I'd like to say hello to everybody on the internet, and uh, I don't know if I did that or not, but it's been a great uh, Sabbath to be here in Jackson and to be able to visit with everybody here in the Jackson area and to visit with you on the internet. But if you turn with me to the first uh, Corinthians, in first Corinthians, the uh, seventh chapter, Paul writes to the Corinthian church there, and he writes to husbands and wives. And I wanted to talk about this particular verse that he writes here and reads and about uh, husbands and wives and families. It's in 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. He says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Elsewhere, their children were unclean, and, and, but now they are made holy. But he says, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace, he says. Well, the word I want to zero in on here today is sanctified, sanctification. What did Paul mean there when he said the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife? Or the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband? <coughs> verse 19 of the same, uh, excuse me, not verse 19 of that chapter. It's in John 17, 17 I'd like to turn to a minute. And we're going to go into some of this uh, understanding of God's word concerning Sanctification. In John 17, 17, Jesus is speaking here, and he tells us that we are to sanctify them through your word. Thy word is truth. So sanctify through the word of God. Sanctify is to make holy. That's one of the definitions of the word. To separate from the ways of this world is what Jesus, I believe, is speaking of here when he says to sanctify them through the word of God, that we are to be separated or set apart from the world. In verse 19 of chapter 17 of John, Jesus says, For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So he mentions twice here that we can be sanctified through the truth of God. The truth is a great separating force. You know, when we speak of truth, there's not much of it in the world today. And we can see that in what's going on in our world today. It doesn't seem to bother anyone, most anyone, I don't mean everyone, to accept the ways of man when they will lie about everything known to man. You know, a man will lie and lie and lie and lie. Our leaders of the country, of our world, and our nation are lying and lying and lying to us. There's not much truth out there. But in God's Word, there is truth. And we can be set apart from that world by the truth of God. It says, to the believer, sanctified is to be set apart. That's to the believer, to be set apart from others who are in this world. You see, it goes kind of hand in hand with letting your light shine. When God opens your mind 
to his Sabbath, to, his, to the ways that Jesus Christ walked on this earth, to the example he set for us. When we understand that, we're definitely going to be set apart from others around us and from the world. I looked up the word sanctification in Webster's, and I thought it was interesting to talk a little bit about that. The definition of sanctify or sanctification is to separate. I've already mentioned that. Set apart. To be appointed to a holy, sac uh, sacred, or religious use. You know, God blessed the seventh day. And he sanctified it. Let's turn to Genesis 2. I think it's good for us to be refreshing our minds about some of the things that we have learned and known for years and years. But it's good to refresh our minds often about the commandments of God, for one, and how he, what he created and what he instilled in the minds of his people. He says, thus, verse 1 of chapter 2, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed that seventh day. He sanctified it. He set it apart from all the other days of the week. When we read Genesis 1, we see that it was the first day, the second day, the third day. He never named any of the first seven or six days. He always was numbered. But the seventh day, he put a name on it. It was special. It was called the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day of God. And he blessed that day. And he, that he rested, and he rested from his work, from all that he had created. And there are a few, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, when I say a few, I'm talking about when you look at the world and the masses of the population of the world, there are a number of the people that do keep the Sabbath. Greater number does not. There's a lot of people in the world that has nothing to do with God in their lives whatsoever. They just go from day to day, week to week, you know, not thinking anything about where anything comes from, like every breath of air we breathe. You know, people talk about, well, there is no God. I don't believe there's a God. I have a hard time with that. And I talk to him, I says, well, <laughs> where do you think this all came from? You know, Mankind in the scientific world has tried to tell us and through ages and ages that things evolved. Which is a ludicrous de definition of what happened. How man came about. How the earth came about. How everything that, there, that we know and live every day came about. Evolution. Well, if that's a true fact, how come we don't ever, you know, how come we don't evolve today? In my lifetime, I've never witnessed anything that evolved, that came from nothing, you know, like slime or whatever you want to talk about. Evolution, you know, and a lot of people believe there's no God, and then you know they'll they'll kind of believe what man has as a counterfeit when he talks about how the earth was made and where man came from. But we're set apart. God, he blessed that seventh day, and he sanctified it. We're purified. We're being prepared for divine service. That's what sanctification is, being prepared for divine service. God is preparing us for service in his kingdom. That's what he's doing with us. That's why we were born. That's why he called us. And I've asked myself this many, many times. You know, why did he call me? You know, out of all the masses of the people on the face of this earth, brothers and sisters of my immediate family, family members and all around me, God never called either one of them. They don't keep the Sabbath. They don't understand what life is what God's plan is, and where we're going to go from here someday. They don't understand that at all. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. 
And we're going to read quite a bit today about the scriptures that are recorded for us, for our learning, for our understanding about sanctification and to being sanctified. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Paul writes, and he says, to be saints, with all that in every place are called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. See, called to be saints, set apart from others. That's some precious thing that God has done for each of one of us that understand it. I mean, it's a priceless thing to be called. To have your minds opened up to when you read the scriptures, the holy word of God, that you can understand what it's saying. See, without that spirit, we don't understand. In verse uh, 3 of that first chapter, he says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from Lord Jesus Christ. Peace unto us. Peace that we receive through the sanctification that he has given to his church, to his people. Verse 10 of the same chapter, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He says, For it has been declared unto me, my brethren, or by, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, and this is what Paul is saying here, that every one of you say, that well, one says I am from Paul, one says I am from Paulus, one says I am from Kephas, one says I am of Christ. Is Christ divided, he says? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God, he says, that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephen or Stephanus, because I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect, he says. We were baptized. And baptism is the first step to being sanctified. To receive the sanctification of God comes through baptism. You know, baptism cleanses us from the corruption and the corrupt way. It purifies us from the sins. See, in the washing of the, our sins away in the waters of baptism, when we went under the waters of baptism, all our sins were cleansed and washed away from us. We came out of that at that one instant for a moment clean. And Christ, our Lord and Savior, made it possible that our sins could be forgiven us. It's through Jesus that we're forgiven for sins. And baptized through that, we, the Holy, <clears throat> to make us holy by de detaching the love of the ways of this world, or, you know, taking the ways of the world away from us, and its defilements of sin. You know, we've got to come out of this world. God told us to come out of the world. I know we got to live in the world. I know we got to walk and rub shoulders in the world. In our jobs. In our walk of life. But we don't have to get wrapped up in the ways of the world. We have to put the ways of the world behind us and away from us. And by doing that, our love becomes toward God. We show our love toward God by obedience to Him. Verse 19, chapter 1. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Boy, can we see that. And what's happening and some of the things that are going on with our leaders of the world. The foolish mistakes they make. The foolish things they say. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. 
It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know, by preaching to those that believe. Now, you can talk and talk and talk to someone until you're blue in the face, as the old saying, or you can beat your head on the wall until you just can't, you know, and if, the, if they don't understand or if God isn't really calling them, they're not going to believe. For the Jews require a sign, Paul said, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but in we, he says, preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. You know, during his time, the Jewish population didn't accept Christ, and there's many that today that have it. They still don't. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, unto them which are called, he says, Jews and Greeks both, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For you see your calling, brethren, he says, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. You see, I've never run into a genius in the church of God, to tell you the truth. A scientist. I haven't even run into very many doctors or lawyers or professional people in the church of God. Never have. In almost 50 years. See, God calls, as he says, the weak things. Verse 27, he's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound those which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. Yes, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, he says, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorifieth, glorifieth, let him glorify in the Lord. See, he is made through sanctification, redeemed us from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin, of course, being death. Eternal death. We're all going to die someday. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You know, either we're going to be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, if we're still standing on this earth when that time comes, or we'll pass away. And when we pass away, what do we do? We go to the grave. We know nothing, we see nothing, we have no uh, idea of any passing of time or anything until that time when he calls at the resurrection. See, there's a resurrection. Jesus Christ is going to perform that resurrection. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Turn the page, uh, over a few pages to chapter 6. And beginning in verse 9. Talking today about sanctification, what it means, what it is. Beginning verse 9, he says, Know you not that the right unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, he says. Neither shall a fornicator, or an idolater, or an adulterer, or an effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That list I just read is about what's going on in our world today. In the population of our world. You see, they don't know that they don't know. They're born into a ready-made world. And they live the traditions of mankind. What's been going on in this ready-made world for them for years? As a child growing up, whatever mom and dad did, you know, grandpa and grandma, the old-time religion, they say. And that's what they live. They don't understand. You know, they haven't been called to have their minds opened. He says, and such were some of you, and we certainly were. But you are washed now. But you are sanctified, set apart. 
but you are justified in the uh, name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. It's through that Spirit of God that we receive at baptism. See, the laying on of hands. Coming up out of the waters of baptism and having the hands of the ministry laid upon you and a heartfelt, fervent prayer that God will give you of His Spirit. And He will give it to you. It's a start that you have in your life with God. And as you continue to grow and as you continue to learn and as you continue to exercise the Spirit, you become stronger and stronger in your commitment to God. Most of us don't understand what our commitment was when we first went underwater. I didn't. I knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I knew that Jesus Christ was the Savior. And I understood that I had to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive that Holy Spirit. And that through Him I could have my sins forgiven. But the commitment that was being made, I didn't understand that at the time. But as you continue to grow in your life and walk in your life and believe in Jesus and follow the example and be faithful to God, your commitment will get stronger, stronger and stronger. 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Paul writing his letters to the churches and explaining to them things that we learn through Paul and through his writings. They're for us now too. For this day. You know, the Bible is not out of date any time. It's for man. No matter what time you, or what century or what generation. It's written in a way for all mankind. First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, beginning verse 1. Paul says to the church, he says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God so you would abound more and more. See, Paul taught how they were to obey God, how they were to follow Jesus, what Jesus wanted us to do. And he rec it's been recorded. God had it recorded for us that we can read it, that we can learn it from it. You see, Paul was taught by Jesus Christ personally. Jesus taught Paul, and Paul relayed that. When his conversion came, it came to the core of his being. He says, For you know that what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, he says. Fornication. Now I know that the world thinks that fornication, what it is, is a sexual thing. But fornication is idolatry and id idol worship. Worshiping something other than God. Other gods. Forsaking the true God. Fornication. Forsaking God. Turning your back on God, so to speak. As most of the world has. That every one of you should know how to possess the vessel in sanctification and honor, he says. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all, such as we also have forewarned you and testified. You know, there's no place to hide from God. And what you do to others, God knows. And if we think we get away from, with something in life, we're kidding ourselves. We're not going to get away with anything. And, you know, the sooner we understand that, I think, and the sooner we begin to realize that God is everywhere. He sees everything we do. He's a loving God. He's not one out there watching us to see if he can trounce on us or jump on us. He's out there watching us with love. And He's got such great love that He forgives us when we stumble. We're human beings. God knows that. 
Our high priest Jesus Christ is sitting right at the right hand of the Father, and he intervenes for us. See, he walked the earth as a man, just like we are. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what sin is. And he knows what Satan, the devil, our enemy, can do. Verse 7, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but to holiness. He therefore that despises us despise not man, but God, who has also given us of his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, we need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another, Paul says. We are to love our brothers and sisters, care for them. Our heart goes out to those who are suffering. When we read the prayer list, it brings tears to our eyes. We love them. I want so much in my prayer that God's kingdom come to stop the suffering that's in the world. And it's not only to the members of God's church, it's to the whole world. All those that have lost loved ones. Since I was gone, that airplane went down over in Indonesia, 162 people. Can we put ourselves in the place of those families who lost, you know, husbands, wives, children, grandchildren? Someday then things will not happen. There'll be a day on this earth when Christ is ruler. And there won't be any more suffering as it is today. Where all mankind will live a happy life, a fruitful life, a joyous life. There won't be all the killings that we see out there in our world today. And all that man does to each other. They'll be taught to love one another as God loves. Verse 10, and indeed, do you, you do it toward all the brethren which are at Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And they, uh, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. You know, don't be a busybody in somebody else's business. You know, we point the finger at one person or another. We got three of them pointing back at ourselves. We need to look in the mirror. We need to not get involved in somebody's business. It's their own business. And if we're going to get involved in anything, it's through a silent prayer with our Father. Praying for someone. Praying for them that may be having a, a situation, you know, that they need help with. Maybe you can see where something is happening to someone and you know it's wrong. You can confront them with it and tell them about it. Personally, one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but I will. And it's not to be put on Facebook for the world to see. You know, what goes on behind your doors and your homes between you and God, and don't think that God don't see it. He does. But there are a lot of things in our lives that we do and things that we are encountered with and that we are confronted with that are personal. And we don't have to tell the world about it. All we have to tell is our, late, our Savior and our God about it. He understands. Revelation 19, verse 1, he says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and has avenged the blood of his saints at, or servants at her hand. See, he judged Satan's religions. He's referring to as the great whore, the false religions of this world. And there are many of them. False teachings, corrupt teachings, the corrupt things on the earth, the fornications that goes on against God, other gods, 
other doctrines, false teachers and false preachers who don't preach the truth of God. And our world's full of them, because if the world wasn't full of them, they'd all be keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> you know, they would be keeping the Sabbath. They'd be obeying what Jesus Christ did. They'd be setting their lives after the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ, following in his footsteps. But they don't. They would rather worship the traditions of men than worshiping God. 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. 2 Thessalonians 2. Paul again writing to the Thessalonica church. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. He says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. So when we talk about sanctification, that's being sanctified by God, by the Holy Spirit, to the truth. Sanctification is knowing the truth of God, obeying God, following the example of Christ. Second chapter of uh, Thessalonians, we were, are in there. Let's back up to verse 15, or go ahead to verse 15. He says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or epistle, the traditions of God. Hold on to them. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, Establish you in every good work and deed. You know, word and good work. Let's go to Second Timothy. The second chapter there of Second Timothy. Second Timothy two. And chapter two, beginning with verse fifteen. He says, study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He tells us to study his word. And that by his spirit in us, it will open our minds to understand the word. We need to study the word. When we study, we're talking to God. God talks to us through his word. But he says, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymismus and Philetus. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You know, there's somebody who will come down the road every year, every so often with some new truth. <laughs> Even amongst our own people. Some new truth, some new idea. And I've said before, if you can't prove what they're saying to you by Scripture, then leave it alone. That's what he's saying here. He says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are His. And boy, does He ever. God knows who are His people. He knows your hearts. He knows your thoughts. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity, he says. Depart from the world, from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepare unto every good work, sanctified for the Master's use, a servant in the kingdom of God. We need to try to serve Him the best we can on earth as a human being, knowing what He has in store for us. We're sanctified, set apart for His use, 
Verse 22, he says, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, love, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and be patient. You know, false doctrines, weird things. He says, don't, don't put that in your mind. Don't even go there. Stay away from that. He says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God pre will give them repentance to the acknowledge of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You see, that's what's flirting with different religions or flirting with something that can't be proved by Scripture is a snare of the devil. The devil is out there. Satan is striving his hardest to destroy the believers of God. You see, Satan knows God's plan. Satan also knows that we have an opportunity to be in that kingdom of God. And he don't want us there because he can't be there. You see, he's going to be bound and thrown in that bottomless pit, as it says in Revelation 20. He's not going to have no opportunity to live on this earth with Jesus Christ. And the snare of the devil has taken a lot of people away from God's church. <clears throat> They're taken captive by him at his will. A lot of people don't believe in the spiritual world. Angels of spirit. Satan's spirit. Demons are spirit or fallen angels. And Satan the devil has a lot more power than any human being on the face of this earth. And the only way that we can keep him from destroying us is staying close to God. Allowing God to be in our lives to protect us. Hebrews, the second chapter. Hebrews 2. Beginning verse 9 of Hebrews 2. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus became a human being walked this earth, and he died for each and every one of us. Verse 10, it says, it is, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. See, the Father directed Jesus to do all the creating. All things are by him. And all things... are made by Him. He is our captain, captain of our salvation. For both He that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. See, there's only one God. And we are all of that one God. For which cause He is not ashamed to call them brethren. See, he is the one who does the sanctification. We are the ones who receive the sanctif are being sanctified. And one day we will be with him totally. He's not ashamed to call us his brothers or sisters, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God has given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took a part of that same, that through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. See, Satan is going to be destroyed. He's going to be put away. 
and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For truly he took not on him the na nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He became a man. Therefore, or wherefore, in all things it behooves him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. See, he is our high priest. Sanctification or sanctified is being reconciled, being redeemed, being forgiven for the sins that we make. We're set apart. We're called by God. We're going to be a part of his family. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Again, we talk from Paul to the church of, of Thessalonica, Thessalonica. In the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, beginning verse 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God has appointed. The believers, those who believe, those who understand, those who continue to walk in His footsteps, the footsteps of Christ. You know, obtain salvation by our Lord who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you also do. And we beseech you, brethren, Paul says, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very high in your love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves, he says. To be at peace... Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, he says. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but every follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice every more, he says. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks to God, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And how many people are thankful to God in this world today? Not many. See, man thinks he can do it all himself. Well, I can do it myself. I can, you know, rule the world or I can solve the problems of the world. I can bring peace. Every leader thinks they can do that. And without God, they can do nothing. Nothing at all. They're not going to bring peace to this world. Peace will never come to this world through mankind. The only way that peace will come to this world is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He said he was coming back, and there are not too many people on this earth that believes that. He said he would come back, and there will be a day when he does. And God knows what day that is. The Father knows. And it's God's, it's up to God to know when, where, why, and how it's all going to be. It's none of our problem. We don't have to worry ourselves about that. What we need to worry ourselves about is being continuing to be faithful, steadfast to what God has given us what He has shown us, and to follow the example that He set us. He says, quench not the Spirit. And we can quench the Spirit by being disobedient to God. He says, quench not it. He says, despise not prophesize, prove all things, and hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you, who will also do it. Faithful is God to make the promises that he has made to mankind, and he will do it. A verse again in Hebrews the 10th chapter, just one verse there in Hebrews 10. As we get close to our close, Hebrews 10 and verse Beginning verse 5, more than one verse here. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he comes unto the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wast not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not no pleasure, or God has no pleasure in them. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. What book is he talking about? This book that we both have and all of us have in front of us. The Holy Scriptures. 
And it was prophesied that Jesus was going to come to this earth long before he came. You know, there's a lot of people and a lot of religions on the earth that say, well, that's Old Testament. <laughs> you know, like we're supposed to throw the Old Testament away. Well, the Old Testament prophesied everything that was going to happen of Christ coming and, all, and so forth. God worked with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He worked with Moses. He worked with many of the people of the Old Testament that we read about. It's for our learning, for our understanding. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin you would not, neither has pleasure in which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, and that he may establish the second. Took away that first covenant that Israel had broken. And he established the second covenant, which is Jesus Christ, our Savior. See, we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore for sins. Jesus Christ is that ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life for us. By the which we <clears throat> will, we are sanctified. See, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Sanctified. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered once a uh, sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is witness to us for after that, or the Holy Spirit, that he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The promise that God made. See, we're sanctified. We're set apart. We're set apart for his work. It's an opportunity for us to be, achieve eternal life. Eternal life in the kingdom of God. We're sanctified by that death of Jesus Christ. Let's drop down to verse 26 of the same chapter. For if we sin willingly after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who has trodden under the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of his covenant wherein he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. You know, how much more, how much sore would be the punishment for those who deny their Savior, Jesus Christ. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs unto me, I will recompense, or recompense, says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And there are many people on this earth today who kind of thumb their nose at God. It's almost blasphemous, the things that you see. And it is blasphemous. See, we had a warning from God from verses 26 through 31, which we just read. You know, giving up the calling and the understanding that God has given us, giving up that sanctified and being sanctified by God is not an option. We can't give up once He has called us, once He has brought us into that fold or the family, that opportunity for eternal life. We just can't give up. We must endure to the end. There's no giving up once God has called you, once you went under the waters of baptism and accepted Him as your personal Savior. You must continue to walk with God. And when you fall down on your knees and you know stumble and fall, then you are to get back up. You are to ask God to come and help you. And He will. When you sin and make a mistake, you can be forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we must go and, and repent of the sins we make and ask God, and He's there to forgive us. He said He'll put our sins as, as far as the east is from the west. He's a loving God. He wants us in His family. Hebrews 13, beginning verse 9. 13 verse 9, he says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, 
which have not profited them that they have occupied therein, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruits of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You know, God is well pleased when we do the things that are right in His sight. Go to First Peter. There's a verse there in First Peter, the second chapter. First Peter two. Excuse me. First Peter one, verse two. First Peter one, verse two. Peter writes, he says, the elect according to the knowledge and the, or the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his life, uh, abundant mercy has forgiven or begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved for in heaven for you. See, he has reserved it. And we're sanctified and been sanctified to God through that Holy Spirit. You know, God's eyes are open to us and open to those who are sanctified. He sees us. He hears our prayers. We're sanctified in our heart. We are to keep His ways and put God first in our life. We are to obey His commandments. And there's all those in the world that says, oh, you can't keep the commandments. Well, you certainly can. God will give you the strength to keep the commandments. We're to be instant in prayer. We need to follow that example of Christ. So, you know, we've seen today that sanctification from God comes to man. When man makes his commitment to God, to accept Jesus Christ and to receive the Spirit through the baptism. To be sanctified is to be set apart, as we've mentioned many times today. We're made holy to God, redeemed from sin through our Savior, Jesus Christ. We started out with 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter. And I need to hurry up to get this finished up because I'm getting a little long here. But 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter. And we read again, and let's read that again, 1 Corinthians 7. He says, For the, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. What did that mean, that sanctification? How is the wife sanctified, or how is the husband sanctified? You know, there's an example in Joshua, and many of you have read this, and know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about Rahab. And let's turn to Joshua, the second chapter. And we'll read a little bit about Rahab. And to make my point of sanctification and what that chapter 7, verse 14 and 15 is saying. Let us read the example of Rahab in Joshua 2, chapter 2. In verse 1, it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to... Uh, spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and they came unto the harlot's house named Har uh, Rahab and lodged there. Okay, she was a, a woman of the night, if you want to call it that. She was a harlot, says. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, they came men in hither to night of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to you and entered into your house, that they may come and search out all the country. And the woman said, the two men, and she took the two men, and they hid them, and said to us, they, there came men unto me, but I don't know where they are, she says. Well, she kind of stretched the truth there a little bit, didn't she? God permitted that. She protected those men. Chapter 6 of Joshua, beginning verse 16. 
chapter 6 and beginning with verse 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are in her house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. See, God protected her. He allowed her to and her family to be spared from all that happened there when the walls of Jericho came down and they were all killed. Verse 22 of that same chapter. Joshua said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she has as you swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and her brethren and all that she had, and they brought it out of the kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. See, they brought it all out. Her and everybody else out of there before and protected her. And it says that she was without the camp. See, she and her family were sanctified. Using the word sanctified, they were set apart. They were set apart from the rest of that city. She was not killed as the rest of the city was when the walls came down and Israel went in. Yet she wasn't allowed to come into the camp of Israel. See, she hadn't been one of the Israelites or one of them. She hadn't done anything more than what God actually revealed to her to, to uh, save and protect the messengers. But her and her family were protected. They were blessed by God. And when the husband is sanctified by the wife or the wife is sanctified by the husband, they receive a blessing from God because of the, belief of the believer. It says the believer in, in 1 Corinthians 7 chapter. They're sanctified because of that believer, that they're set apart, that they are protected. And it doesn't mean that they will be in the kingdom of God. You see, being sanctified or set apart or protected doesn't mean you're going to be in the kingdom of God. You have to first do something of, on your own. You see, just like Rahab and her family, she, those that are sanctified, talking about husband and wives again and children, they will be given an opportunity to be in the kingdom of God, yet they must make their own commitment. You know, they must begin to make their own commitment. When they get of age. See, they have to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior also. They have to be baptized in order to be sanctified and set apart. They have to be baptized. They have to receive the Spirit that comes from God. They have to follow Jesus Christ as his believer. Just like Rahab and her family were set apart, they were not permitted into the camp. You see, they hadn't made a commitment. So they weren't permitted inside of the camp of Israel. Joshua 6.23 tells us that they were without the camp. See, brethren, there's no free pass for anyone to enter the kingdom of God. You know, just because you believe, and maybe your wife doesn't believe, doesn't make a free pass for her to go right into the kingdom of God. She can be protected through all the days of her life with you. Her fa your family can be protected. God can look after her and watch over her. But there's no free pass to eternal life. See, there's some day that uh, all people are going to have to be making their own decision, just like you did, just like I did. See, we can't stand in the stead for somebody else. So, brother, let us praise God. Let's give him thanks for our calling that he gave us. Let's give him thanks for the understanding and for the sanctification that he made when he sanctified us when he set us apart. And let's not take it lightly in our lives. Let us be steadfast, endure to the end, to be faithful to God, and to that end, whatever it may be, and let us all be in that kingdom of God when Christ returns.